could not only tr threaten uh, friends of ours like Israel, trigger a nuclear arms race in the region, but could uh, over the long term uh, potentially threaten us. Whether we can actually get a deal done, we're going to have to find out over the next uh, three to four weeks. We have presented to them a framework that would allow them to meet their peaceful energy needs. And if, in fact, what uh, their leadership says, that they don't want to develop a nuclear weapon, if that is, in fact, true, then they've got an avenue here to provide that assurance to the world uh, community and this, uh, in a progressive, step-by-step, -step, uh, verifiable way, uh, allow them to get out from under sanctions so that they can uh, re-enter uh, as full-fledged members of the international community. Um, but they have their own politics. And there is a long tradition of mistrust between the two countries. And there is a sizable portion of the political elite that you know, cut its teeth on anti-Americanism and still finds it uh, convenient to blame America for every ill that there is. And whether, uh, whether they can manage to say yes to what clearly would be better for Iran, better for the region, and better for the world is an open question. We'll find out over the next, uh, over the next several weeks. All right. Sir, if the, on whether or not you have the power unilaterally to, to relax sanctions to implement an agreement? Yeah. I, 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 there are a series of different sanctions. There are multilateral sanctions. There are UN sanctions. There are sanctions that uh, have been imposed by us, uh, this administration, unilaterally. And I think it's different for each of those areas. Uh, but it, I don't want to put uh, the cart before the horse. What I want to do is see if we, in fact, have a deal. If we do have a deal that I have confidence will prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon and that we can convince uh, the world and the public will prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, um, then you know, it will be time to engage in Congress. And I think that we'll be able to make a strong argument to Congress that this is the best way for us to uh, avoid a nuclear Iran, uh, that it will be more effective than any other alternatives we might take, including military action. But that requires it being a good deal. And I've said consistently that uh, I'd rather have no deal than a bad deal, because what we don't want to do is lift sanctions and provide uh, Iran legitimacy, but not have the verifiable mechanisms to make sure uh, that they don't break out and produce a nuclear weapon. Okay. Um, Ed Henry. I missed you guys. I haven't done this in a while. I know. I've missed you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. I haven't heard you. I haven't heard you say a specific thing during this news conference that you would do differently. You've been asked it a few different ways. I understand you're going to reach out, but you've talked about doing that before. It's almost like you're doubling down on the same policies and approach you've had for six years. And so my question is, why not pull a page from the Clinton playbook and admit you have to make a much more dramatic shift in course for these last two years? And on ISIS. It was a pretty dramatic setback in the last few days with it appearing that the Syrian rebels have been routed. There are some Gitmo detainees who have rejoined the battlefield, helping ISIS and other terror groups, mm. is, is what the reports uh, yeah, are suggesting. I, so my question is, are we winning? Well, I, I think it's, it's too early to say whether we are winning because, uh, as I said at the outset of the ISIL campaign, um, this is going to be a long-term plan to solidify the Iraqi government, to solidify their security forces, to make sure that, in addition to our air cover, that they have the capacity to run a ground game that pushes ISIL back from some of the territories that they had taken, that we have a strong international uh, coalition that we've now built, but that they are on the ground, providing the training, providing the equipment, uh, providing uh, the supplies that are necessary for uh, Iraqis to fight on behalf of their territory. And what I also said was that in Syria, that's been complicated and that's not going to be solved anytime soon. Our focus in Syria is not to solve the entire Syria situation, but rather to isolate the areas in which ISIL can operate. 
And there is no doubt that because of the extraordinary bravery and of our men and women in uniform and the precision of our pilots and the strikes that have taken place, that ISIL is in a more vulnerable position and it is more difficult for them to maneuver than it was previously. Now, there is a specific issue about trying to get a moderate opposition in Syria that can serve as a partner with us on the ground. That's always been the hardest piece of, uh, piece of business to, to get done. Uh, there are a lot of opposition groups in Syria along a spectrum, from radical jihadists who are our enemies to folks who believe in inclusive democracy and everything in between. Uh, they fight among each other. Uh, they uh, are fighting the regime. And what we're trying to do is to find a core group that we can work with, that we have confidence in, that we've vetted, that can help in regaining territory from ISIL and then ultimately serve as uh, a responsible party to sit at the table uh, in eventual political negotiations that are probably some ways off in the future. Uh, that's always been difficult. Uh, as, as you know, uh, one of the debates has consistently been, you know, uh, should the Obama administration provide more support to the opposition? Could that have averted some of the problems that are taking place in Syria? And as I've said before, part of the challenge is it's a messy situation. Uh, this is not a situation where we have one single, unified, uh, broad-based, effective, reliable. No. Uh, let, 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 me, let me answer the question. Ed. The uh, and so, uh, what we are going to continue to test is: Can we get a more stable, effective, cohesive, moderate opposition? But that's not the sole measure of whether we are "quote unquote" winning or not. Remember, our first focus, Ed, here is to drive ISIL out of Iraq. And what we're doing in Syria is, first and foremost, in service of reducing ISIL's capacity to resupply and send troops and then run back in over the Syrian border to eventually reestablish a border between Iraq and Syria so that slowly Iraq regains control of its security and its territory. That is our number one mission. That is our number one focus. There are aspects of what's going on in Syria that you know, we've got to deal with in order to uh, reduce the scope of ISIL's operations. So, for example, our support for Kurds uh, in Kobani, uh, where they've been able to hold off uh, ISIL and where we've been able to effectively strike uh, ISIL positions consistently, uh, that's not just because we're trying to solve a Syria problem. That's also because it gives us an opportunity to further weaken ISIL so that we can meet our number one mission, which is, uh, which is Iraq. Uh, in, in terms of uh, things to do differently, I, you know, I guess, Ed, you're, uh, the, the question you're asking uh, is one actually I think I have answered. Uh, if, if you're asking about personnel or uh, if you're asking about uh, position on issues or what have you, then uh, it's probably premature because I want to hear what 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 what, what, what Ed, what what, I, what 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 I'd like to do is to hear from the Republicans to find out what it is that they would like to see happen, and what I'm committing to is making sure that I am open to working with them on the issues that where they think that there's going to be cooperation. Now, that isn't a change because I've suggested to them before that where uh, they think there's areas of cooperation, I'd like to see uh, uh, us get some, some things done. Um, but the fact that they now control both chambers of, uh, of Congress, I think, means that perhaps they have more confidence that they can pass their agenda and get a b bill on my desk. Uh, it means that negotiations end up uh, perhaps uh, being a little more real because uh, you know, they have larger majorities, for example, in the House, and they may be able to get some things through uh, their caucuses that they couldn't before. Uh, but the bottom line that the American people want to know and uh, that I'm going to repeat here today is that my number one goal, because I'm not running again, I'm not on the ballot, I don't have uh, any further political aspirations. 
My number one goal is just to deliver as much as I can for the American people in these last two years. And wherever I see an opportunity, no matter how large or, or, or how small, to make it a little bit easier for a kid to go to college, make it a little more likely that somebody's finding a good paying job, make it a little more likely that uh, somebody has high quality health care. Um, even if I'm not getting a whole loaf, uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in getting uh, whatever uh, legislation we can get passed that adds up to uh, improve prospect, uh, prospects and an improved future for the American people. Sam Stein. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, following the elections, congressional Republicans are pushing once again for major reforms to your Health Care Act. In the past, you've said you're open to good ideas, yep. but you don't want to undermine the bill. Can you tell us what specific ideas you're ruling out? Have the election results changed your calculus on reforming the law? And how confident are you heading into the second enrollment period? And on a totally unrelated matter, <laughs> uh, have you settled on a nominee to replace Attorney General Eric Holder? And if so, who is it? You guys want to spread out your news a little bit, don't you? The, uh, you don't want it all just one big bang. The, uh, uh, on the Attorney General, um, we have a, a number of outstanding candidates who uh, we're taking a look at now. Uh, and in due course, I will have an announcement. And you'll be there, Sam, when that's announced. Um, but I'm confident that we'll find somebody who is well qualified, uh, will elicit the confidence of the American people, uh, will uphold uh, uh, their constitutional obligations and rule of law, and uh, will get confirmed by the Senate. Um, on health care, there are certainly some lines I'm going to draw. Uh, repeal of the law. <laughs> I won't sign. Um, efforts that would take away health care from the 10 million people who now have it uh, and the millions more who are eligible to get it, uh, we're not going to support. Uh, in some cases, there uh, may be recommendations that uh, Republicans have for uh, changes that would undermine uh, the structure of the law. And, you know, I'll, I'll be very honest with them about that and say, look, the, the law doesn't work if you pull out that piece or that piece. Uh, on the other hand, what I have said is there's no law that's ever been passed that is perfect. Uh, and given the contentious nature in which it was passed in the first place, there are places where uh, if I were just drafting uh, a bill uh, on our own, we would have made those changes back then, and certainly, uh, as we've been implementing, there are some other areas where uh, we think we can do even better. Um, so, you know, if in fact one of the items on uh, Mitch McConnell's agenda and John Boehner's agenda is to make uh, responsible changes to the Affordable Care Act to make it work better, uh, I'm going to be very open and receptive to, to hearing those ideas. But what I will remind them is that despite all the contention, uh, we now know that the law works. You've got millions of people who have health insurance who didn't have it before. You've got states that have expanded Medicaid to folks who did not have it before, including Republican governors who have concluded this is a good deal for their state. Um, and despite some of the previous predictions, even as we've in, uh, enrolled more people into the uh, Affordable Care Act and given more people the security of health insurance, health care inflation has gone down every single year since the law passed uh, so that we now have uh, the lowest increase in health care costs in 50 years, which is saving us about $180 billion in reduced uh, overall costs uh, to the federal government and it's uh, in the Medicare program. So we are, uh, I think, really proud of the work that's been done, but there's no doubt that there are areas uh, where we can improve it. So uh, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing what, uh, what list they've got of, uh, of improvements. Is the individual mandate one of those lines you can't cross? Yeah, the individual mandate is a line I can't cross because 
the concept borrowed from Massachusetts from a law instituted by uh, a former opponent of mine, uh, Mitt Romney, uh, understood that if you're providing health insurance to people through uh, the private marketplace, uh, then you've got to make sure that people can't game the system and just wait until they get sick before they go try to buy health insurance. You, you can't ensure that people with pre-existing conditions can get health insurance unless you also say, while you're healthy, before you need it, uh, you've, got to, uh, uh, you've got to get health insurance. And obviously, there are hardship exemptions. We understand that there are some folks who, uh, even with the generous subsidies that have been provided, uh, still can't afford it. But, um, but that's a central uh, component of the law. Um, in terms of enrollment, uh, we'll, we'll do some additional announcements about that uh, in, in the days to come. Uh, starting in the middle of this month, people can sign up again. I think there are a number of people who the first time around sat on the sidelines in part because of uh, our screw-ups on healthcare.gov. Uh, that's one area, Ed, by the way, uh, it's very particular. We're, we're really making sure that the website works super well uh, before uh, the next open enrollment period. Um, we're, we're double and triple checking it. And, uh, and, and so I think a lot of people who maybe initially thought, we're not sure how this works. Let's wait and see. Uh, they're going to have an opportunity now to, to sign up. And what's been terrific is to see how more private insurers have come into the marketplace so that there's greater competition in more markets all around the country. The premiums that have come in uh, that are available to people and the choices that are available uh, are better than a lot of people, I think, had predicted. Uh, so the law is working. That doesn't mean it can't be improved. Major Garrett. Thank you, Mr. President. And if you do miss us, uh, allow me to humbly suggest we do this every week. We might. Uh, you know, who knows? I don't know. Right. I'm having a great time. Let me go back to immigration. Moments before you walked out here, yes. sir, Mitch McConnell said, and I quote, that if you, in fact, yeah. use your executive authority to legalize a certain number of millions of undocumented workers, it would poison the well, direct quote, and it would be like waving a red flag in front of a bull. Do you not believe that is the considered opinion of the new Republican majority in the House and Senate? And do you also not believe what they have said in the aftermath of last night's results, that the verdict rendered by voters should stop you or should prevent you from taking this action because it was a subtext in many of the campaigns. Yeah. Let me ask you a couple of specifics. Republicans haven't made a mystery about some of the things they intend to say. Oh, uh, do, do I have to write all these no, down? It's, it's you're, 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 you're very well familiar with these. These will not be yeah, mysteries no, I, to you. But I, but I, uh, you know. Keystone XL pipeline. They all will right. send you legislation on that. They will ask you to repeal the medical device tax as a part of a funding mechanism of the Affordable Care Act. And they have said they would like to repatriate some maybe $2 trillion of offshore revenue at the corporate level by reforming the corporate tax code without touching the individual tax code. To use your words, Mr. President, are any of those three lines you cannot cross and also deal with what you perceive to be Republican attitudes about immigration? All right. Um, I think, Major, that uh, I answered the question on immigration. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, there will be some Republicans who uh, are angered or frustrated by uh, any executive action that I may take. Um, those are folks, I, I just have to say, who uh, are also deeply opposed to immigration reform in any form and blocked the House from being able to pass a bipartisan bill. Uh, I have said before that I actually believe that um, John Boehner is sincere about wanting to get immigration reform passed, uh, which is why for a year I held off taking any action uh, beyond what we had already done for the so-called Dream Kids and uh, did everything I could to give him space and room to get something done. And what I also said at the time was, if in fact Congress, if this Congress could not get something done, then I would take further executive actions in order to make the system work better, understanding that any bill that they pass will supplant 
the executive actions that I take. So uh, I, I just want to reemphasize this, uh, Major. If, in fact, there is a great eagerness on the part of Republicans to tackle a broken immigration system, then they have every opportunity to do it. My executive actions not only do not prevent them from passing a law that supersedes those actions, but should be a spur for them to actually try to get something done. And I am prepared to engage them with every step of the way uh, with their ideas. Um, I think we should have further broad-based debate among the American people. Um, as I've said before, I do think that the episode with the unaccompanied children changed a lot of attitudes. I think what may also change a lot of attitudes is when the public now realizes that that was a very temporary and isolated event and that, in fact, uh, we have fewer illegal immigrants coming in today than we did five years ago, 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, but that what we also have is a system that is not serving our economy well. So Republicans who say the election was a referendum, at least in part, on your intentions to use executive authority for immigration. It, as I said before, I, I don't want to try to read the tea leaves on uh, election results. What I am going to try to do is, as president is to make sure that I'm advancing what I think is best for the country. And here's an opportunity where I can use my administrative authorities executive authorities and, and, and lawfully try to make improvements on the existing system, understanding that that's not going to fix the entire problem and we're much better off if we go ahead and pass uh, a comprehensive bill. And I hope that uh, the Republicans really want to get it passed. If they do, they're going to have a lot of cooperation from me. Um, so let me just tick off uh, on Keystone. There's an independent process. It's moving forward. And the, uh, I'm going to let that process play out. I've, I've given some parameters in terms of how I think about it. Ultimately, is this going to be good for the American people? Is it going to be good for their pocketbook? Is it going to actually create jobs? Is it actually going to reduce gas prices that have been coming down? And is it going to be on net something that doesn't increase climate change that we're going to have to grapple with? There's a pending uh, case before a Nebraska judge about some of the siting. The process is moving forward, and I'm just going to gather up the facts. I will note, while there, this debate about Canadian oil has been raging, keep in mind this is Canadian oil, this isn't U.S. oil, while that debate has been raging, we've seen the, some of the biggest increases in American oil production and American natural gas production in our history. We are closer to energy independence than we've ever been before or at least as we've been in decades, we're imp uh, we are importing less foreign oil than we produce for the first time in a very long time. We've got a 100-year supply of natural gas that if we responsibly um, tap, puts us in the strongest position when it comes to energy of any industrialized country around the world. If you, when I travel to Asia or I travel to Europe, their biggest envy is the incredible homegrown U.S. energy production that is producing jobs and uh, attracting manufacturing because locating here means uh, you've got lower energy costs. So our energy sector is booming. And I'm happy to engage Republicans with additional ideas for how we can enhance that. I should note that our clean energy uh, production is booming as well. Um, and so Keystone I just consider as one small aspect of a broader trend that's really positive for the American people. Um, and let's see. See, the, may, may, okay, medical device tax. I, you know, I, I've already answered uh, 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 the question. Uh, we are going to take a look at whatever ideas. L l let me take a look comprehensively at the ideas that they present. Uh, let's give them time to, to tell me. I'd, I'd rather hear it from them than from you. Ma Major, uh, you know, uh, they, I'm just telling you what well, they conceivably, I could uh, just cancel my meeting on Friday because I've heard everything from you. <laughs> I think I'd rather let Mitch McConnell. If it was mine, you couldn't cross. I'd, I'd, I'd rather hear, hear from Mitch McConnell and John Boehner what ideas they'd like to pursue, and, and we'll have a conversation with them on that. Um, 
On repatriation, I said in my opening remarks that there is an opportunity for us to do uh, a tax reform package that is good for business, good for jobs, and can potentially finance infrastructure development here in the United States. Now, the devil's in the details. So I think conceptually, it's something where we may have some overlap, and uh, I'm very interested in pursuing ideas uh, that can put folks to work right now in roads and bridges and uh, waterways and ports and uh, a better air traffic control system. Uh, if we had one, by the way, we could reduce delays by about 30 percent. We could reduce fuel costs uh, for airlines by about 30 percent, and hopefully that would translate into cheaper uh, airline tickets, which I know everybody would be interested in. So there's all kinds of work we can do on our infrastructure. This may be one mechanism that, com uh, that Republicans are comfortable in, in, uh, uh, in financing those kinds of efforts. Uh, so that will be part of the discussion that I think uh, we're prepared for on Friday and then uh, in the weeks uh, to come leading into the new Congress. Whew. Major, major uh, works me, man. Uh, Jim Acosta. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I know you don't want to read the tea leaves, but uh, it is a fact that your party rejected you in these midterms. By and large, they did not want you out on the campaign trail in these key battleground states. How do you account for that? And your uh, aides have said that this is the fourth quarter of your administration. Uh, but I don't know if you saw the morning talk shows, but uh, there were several potential candidates for 2016 who were out there already. Uh, is the clock ticking? Are you running out of time? How much time do you have left? And what do you make of the notion that you're now a lame duck? Well, traditionally, after the last midterm of a two-term presidency, since I can't run again, uh, that's, uh, that's the label that, uh, that you guys apply.